Well, hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I was asked to come here today because I am a successful entrepreneur. Now, that can mean many things, and I'd just like to ask all of you, what does success mean to you? How do you define success? Having, Having money. Something you enjoy doing. Getting a job when you graduate. Getting a job when you graduate. Sure. I didn't hear that. Living a fulfilling life. Anything else? Having a good work ethic. Shout them out. <laughs> Having a good work ethic. Right, what else? Reaching your goals. I love it. What else? Creating good what? Business networking. Creating good business networking, yes. Anything else? So it sounds like some of you have already put a good grasp on what you consider to be success. Success is often determined in several ways. Money, as mentioned, power, fame, happiness, security, freedom, connection, time, or any number of other ways. Our perception of success is also determined by several factors. Family, friends, colleagues, competition, society, as well as our values. Try to get the mouse to work, sorry. <laughs> so take a moment and think about what you really value most in life. Do any of you have notepads with you? Yeah? Go ahead and write that down. It can be a couple of, of things. Um, write down what you value most in life. Some of you shouted it out earlier. I heard money. What were some of the other values that you have? Maybe you think of success and values differently. What are some values that you have? Happiness. Happiness. Friendship. Friendship. Power. Sorry? Power. power. Yes, power. Anything else? Sorry? Autonomy. Good. <clears throat> These are your core values as a business person, and this will be what motivates you. This will be what determines whether or not you feel success in your life as well as in your career. And in my opinion, this is the first step in starting an entrepreneurship. Actually, starting an entrepreneurship, the first step is learning to confidently spell the word entrepreneur. <laughs> Has anybody out there had a double check? Yeah? Be honest, <laughs> I have had two. Um, when I decided to try an alternative route and be my own boss, it was significantly against the advice of my father, whom I respect probably more than any other person. My family's value of success, or my, the way that my family saw success, was very different and is what my dad considered a more traditional model than, than the life that I live. My colleagues offered caution, my colleagues being at the time all tenure track, are mostly tenure track professors or established symphonic performers in the music field. They established, they offered caution, concern of uh, whether or not I would be able to pay my bills or retire one day or any of those things. It was an incredibly scary step for me to take to be my own boss. And there are often times, even today, that I still feel very scared. But for the most part, I feel quite uh, confident and very rewarded. And to be honest, I was a little surprised when I was asked to come and be part of this entrepreneurship week. I never thought of describing myself as an entrepreneur. I was just a person who was trying to make things work. Um, trying to make my life what I wanted my life to be, um, and trying to make a living while I was doing it. To me, I hadn't given that a label or a definition. It was just what I was trying to do. Um, and so when I was asked to be part of this week, I at first was going to say, no, that, that doesn't fit me. But when I began to think about what it is that I do, I sort of got a little bit of an understanding of it. So uh, just since I see a Quite a nice audience out here. How many of you out there are musicians? OK. 
okay, hiding to the backs of the, the hall, <laughs> like good musicians do. Um, and how many of you plan to be music professionals? Do any of you think that you're going to be a music entrepreneur? A couple of hands go up. So, in the case of musicians and other fine arts professionals, you almost always become an entrepreneur in some way. Um, as mentioned before, whether you are performing and making, um, marketing your own concerts, if you're teaching and trying to recruit students, whatever it is that you're doing in music, you are actually working as an entrepreneur. What are the fields we have out there? Please feel free to shout. Finance? Finance? Retail. 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 Marketing, management, what else? Video production. Video production. So we have quite a diverse crowd out there. Um, today I hope to present a couple of um, very broad suggestions or concepts, um, but most of my examples are going to be a little bit more specifically based around the music industry since that is where my career has mostly been. Um, although I'm most known as a music teacher, I hope to be able to offer all of you a, a couple of nuggets at least. Um, I'm not going to call it advice, but maybe some things that you can take away with you. So I guess I should take a moment, since not all of you uh, came and heard me play when I performed here a year and a half ago, to just briefly introduce myself um, to those of you out there who don't know me. <clears throat> My background and interests are very diverse. And for a while, I was embarrassed by, embarrassed by how many ways I spend my time and energy. A jack of all is a master of none, or so I was told many, many, many times. Um, and there have been times when meeting somebody new, and they ask, what do you do, that I didn't really know what to say, and I especially didn't know where to begin. Um, and in consideration with sometimes when you have a very broad lifestyle, people begin to think that maybe um, you are not driven in, toward a goal. But I don't at all, even a little, believe that one cannot master many fields and be successful in each. You can master anything that fits within your values. So when you set those values earlier, that is what is going to hold you to success. That is what is going to encompass the steps that you take to get there. And any goal that you have that fits within those values are attainable, regardless of how diverse or how many values you have. If it is a value of yours, you will find a way. So I went to school for a little while, um, about eight and a half years to finish my doctorate, which I uh, defended exactly five years ago next week. So I'm kind of going to call my advisor and celebrate that a little bit. Um, and really, that just resulted in an extremely large document frame that isn't even hanging on a wall right now. Um, during that time, I decided to start teaching people how to use their bodies more efficiently, how to practice breathing, how practicing these things can change their lives, and what meditation means today. So I also have a background as a yoga instructor. Um, <clears throat> Shortly after completing my degree, and toward the end of my career in Pennsylvania, I was taken under the wing of a really wonderful, great man who happened to be the president of the De Bono Group. He was the chair of the search committee for CEO of the Pennsylvania Academy of Music, for which I um, was interviewing. And I was offered the job, and with, they presented it to the board of directors, and the board of directors decided to to close the school, so I didn't actually ever act as CEO, but in that time, I apparently made an impression on him. He personally certified me and asked me to work for his company and represent his company, and I've gotten to do so many great things because of his belief in me as well. With his background, I've gotten to do some pretty cool things, all of which have influenced the way I work now, have influenced the way that I live now, have influenced each and every day. I was teaching assistant for the University of Kansas and chair of theory and composition for the Pennsylvania Academy of Music when I took that job. I was also the lead grant proposal writer after the restructuring of it and worked in development. 
I was the artist in residence for Millersville in, uh, University. I was the interim instructor flute at Western Illinois University. I was also the sales and marketing manager for North America and South America for Trevor James Flutes, which is an international flute company for those of you who aren't flutists out there. Now I'm trying to narrow my fields of work. Um, maybe I would be better if I narrowed it down to one line of work, but one of my values is I value the diversity of challenges that I have in my current life, as well as doing something a little bit different every day. I have no monotony in my life. Every day is different. Every day is exciting. There's not a day that I wake up and think I have to go to that office again or anything, which for a while was my life and I appreciated what I got out of it and the opportunities, um, but my core values led me in a different direction. I enjoy teaching yoga. It gives my mind and body the break they need. <clears throat> and I've had a great time training leaders for the likes of Lindenwood University, Kaskaskia College, and small business owners. I've also sat on advisory panels for Wells Fargo and Purina as a bono consultant, which are some significant companies. Um, but the majority of my heart is poured into Allison Flute Studio, which is a studio in St. Louis where I offer private flute lessons in the St. Louis Metro. From all of those experiences, I've learned about different music industries and business practices. I also developed an understanding of my values. I learned that I valued being part of an organization where I had colleagues and a support group. But I learned that I was tired <clears throat> of, of thinking that I could do my boss's job better than they could. I was tired of being dissatisfied with my work conditions. And I also learned that I valued, most of all, my time and my happiness. <clears throat> For 10 years, I taught at nationally accredited brick and mortar schools. I liked it when I wasn't butting heads with my administration. I had a nice office with a lovely view for six of those years and some job security for part of that time. When I noticed schools reducing funding for the arts, music positions being cut, and nonprofits closing their doors, I realized something might soon be changing in my life. I moved to St. Louis 18 months ago with hopes of opening a performing arts school, much like the one I was part of restructuring in Pennsylvania. There wasn't one on the Illinois side of St. Louis, and I saw potential. I knew what I wanted to do. The second, second step I recommend is to set your focus. What is it that you hope to do? What, be, what would be the product of your niche or your line of work? Is it a common job or lifestyle or something totally unusual? Know that there is an, every, know that there is an audience or a client for every product and for every service. Someone somewhere thinks your idea is awesome. No matter how basic, no matter how crazy it is, it might not be where you are right now, but somewhere someone is going to want what it is that you think is wanted. Sometimes it takes a little bit of lurk looking. Sometimes it, took, it takes a lot of pounding the pavement, a lot of marketing. Sometimes it takes some time, but you can find an audience for your product. When supporting your focus, value your time and know what you're worth. But don't expect that everyone's going to see the same value. In some markets, you might have to lower your rate. I charge less for lessons in St. Louis than I did for Pennsylvania. I charge about 50% more in Pennsylvania than I charge now. At first, that was really hard for me to swallow. Um, but on my list of core values, money wasn't near the top. Um, my family, my friends, my, my life, I grew up in St. Louis. And so coming back here after about 12 years away was more valuable to me than the uh, <coughs> difference in, in money that I was uh, making. Uh, some markets just do not, are not open to your product or service at the time. You have to choose either to wait it out or teach that value to the community or consider other markets. Um, when I was doing some research 
uh, in my year of Western, I knew I was there only one year, and I had decided that I did not want to move back to Pennsylvania. I pulled up a census report of the state of Illinois on income per ca uh, for households on a map that showed counties. And when I was considering where it was that I was going to teach, knowing that teaching music is considered, uh, taking music lessons is considered a luxury for some, it kind of narrowed some, community, uh, some counties down that I probably wouldn't find enough students in those counties because of the uh, average household income that maybe I should look at other counties. After you set the focus, plan how to get there. Create a road map. And if you've got that paper, go ahead and get it out right now and write your focus at the top of the paper. Would anybody volunteer just out of curiosity to share their focus? Think about it. I'll come to that in just a minute. Learn what others have done. Learn what others have done in that same field. Learn what others have done in other fields. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to completely reinvent this process. If there's a path that leads to success that fits within your values, there's no shame in using those footsteps as a guide. Just be sure to keep your head on the focus and not on those footsteps. Keep your head up, see your goal, not on the ground. So has anyone ventured the, uh, has anyone had the courage to volunteer their focus? Come on, we're friendly people here, right? Yes, we'll do that. Uh huh. You'd like to be what? An all-American goalkeeper on a soccer team? Okay, so what are some roads that other people have taken to get there? Being good at saving balls, practicing, joining teams or other leagues. Um, what else could get you there? Hard work, sure. Any more specific roads that you could take? Now here's one thing I'd like to offer to everybody. We oftentimes try to find a path that seems like one that's already been done or already acceptable. So with the, what is your name? <coughs> Jessica? With Jessica's goal of being an all-American goalkeeper, I want people to shout out any path that you think could get her there without any justification at all. And you've got paper? She's gonna write down every single suggestion that you give her, all right? So join a league. Take yoga. What else? Come on. She's got a whole notepad. Get a mentor. Help your defenders get better. Help your defenders get better. Know the right people. Make a YouTube highlight video. Make a YouTube highlight video. Be determined. Be determined? Come on, these are all pretty safe things. Can anybody throw out something completely unusual? Bribe somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rent a truck, create a goal in the back of the truck, drive it to public places, and do demonstrations on every street corner. Take that truck and park it outside of regional or national events, soccer events. These don't have to be realistic. Come on, a few more, a few more ideas. Rent a local new, uh, TV station to show perform, uh, cycle performances of your catching goals and only your catching goals. Make a press kit. Make a press kit. Two thirds of the audience are musicians, right? Let's get some creative ideas, just two more. No one? Okay. A goalkeeping jingle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Anything else? So when we're coming up with ideas, they don't all have to be immediately accessible. They don't all have to make sense. But even you're giving this kind of feedback could maybe stimulate some thought in her that might work. Or as she creates what I'm going to suggest is literally a physical map, these paths might not all be ones that she can reach right now. But further down her career, she might very well be able to get a TV news station to show clips of her. Further down her career, it might not be unrealistic to have a press kit. So create the map. Um, and don't be afraid to put the most obscure ideas on there. <clears throat> These can be both realistic and ideal. Um, the world is fast changing, and what worked before might not now work the same way. What works today also might not work tomorrow. So this is why we need to be constantly evolving as business owners. Yes? What are some creative ideas In, in my personal career? Can I, can I come to those when they come in my story? Absolutely. <laughs> um, let's see, but as in, in the yoga world, since that's not what I'm gonna talk about tonight, in the yoga world, um, I have seen many th different things, and in Pennsylvania, we started something called pop-up yoga, where as opposed to yoga being done just in a studio, um, which is sometimes a little bit scary for people to come to, yoga is being done now one day at a week at an art gallery, one day a week at a bookstore, one day a week at a CD store, one day a week at a nursing home, one day a week at different places. Um, and I know that musicians are also taking this, this idea that um, Cleveland Orchestra is doing concerts in bar venues, uh, chamber concerts, small concerts. And um, in St. Louis, we have a group called the Chamber Project of St. Louis, and they are also now doing performances um, in bars and restaurants and places that aren't quite so intimidated to come to as a concert venue might be. So those are some, if 20 years ago you had suggested to a classically trained professional musician who wears a tuxedo every week that they should go perform in a bar, they probably wouldn't have been extremely open to that idea. So um, there's an example of, of the things that we've been seeing. Uh, it's important to support your ideas as well. <clears throat> um, supporting your ideas are what's going to make it seem like something that you can do and should do, as well as influence other people to, to believe that as well. So let me um, give you another example. A studio teacher today is a different job now than it was for my teacher. Um, now there are many more people in a smaller area with degrees and with experience. Um, the students today are different. They have more distractions. They are busier. Um, fewer of them are focused on music. Family values have changed. Some of the parents I talk to are absolutely willing to spend $100 a month on their students' cell phone service, but aren't willing to spend that or less on one-on-one um, -on -one tutelage. Um, students and parents are both busier than when I was younger, and it seems like few are willing to go for their weekends or their evenings to drive for a lesson. And although my teacher's approach to teaching lessons, where she had us come to her on the, every you know, evening or weekend, um, and it was amazing for my teachers, it just it wouldn't work for me now. Um, I need a different approach than theirs. So for everyone, uh, Jennifer and, and everyone else, write a map that includes as many new paths as you can think of, new and old. Seek unique and viable paths toward your focus. But keep in mind your starting point as you're listing all of these other paths, regardless of how unrealistic they seem. So for me, the sample that I mentioned earlier was when I first moved to St. Louis, I wanted to open my own performing arts school. And I tried to think of ways to get there. So I considered roads taken by others that had similar results. And I also considered unique ways, ways that hadn't quite been done yet, 
things that I had learned from my time as writing business plans for the restructuring of the Pennsylvania Academy of Music and, and so forth. Um, and I understood that not all starting places were within my grasp um, and where I was in life. <clears throat> as you're supporting your focus, you need to take some time to think of why you think your idea, your focus, is great. It's going to be useful to you on the hard days, the days when it seems like you can't go on, the days when it seems like um, society is against you, or the economy is against you, or whatever it might be. Um, there will be hard days, probably regardless of what it is that you decide to do. This is also going to be useful when you're seeking loans from a bank. It's going to be useful if you're approaching an angel investor or a family member for help, or if you're just seeking emotional support from a friend or colleague. You've got to go beyond your feelings and find some logical positives. For a positive to be logical, it must have reason. So in your own notebooks or your own concept, think right now, take a moment and say, this focus or this idea is beneficial because So do you want to share yours or? Sure. Sure. Good. Um, or another thought is with a logical positive, the concept of becoming a goalkeeper. This is something that will work because I've got the time, I've got the talent, I've practiced, I've got the drive, I've got all these things. With physical products, it might be a little bit easier for you to see this is going to work because. Um, if you've done market research, you might be able to say this is going to work because the markets show it will, and so forth. So support your focus with as many logical positives as possible. Leave out the emotion for now. There's a time and a place for emotion. Set it where you can just know that what you're saying is actually going to work. When I was leaving my last job, I got in touch with several colleagues who own recognizable music studios or managed art spaces for both for-profit and non-profit venues. I asked them how they started, what they did. I asked them if they incorporated or not. I asked them if, how they file taxes. I asked them the pros and the cons of renting a space, the pros and cons of buying a building and renting space to others. I tried to see as many possible routes that others have taken. I imagined alternative paths that could be paved, and I drew them out like a map. Um, it's important to realize that not all paths are the same starting point as you. Another person might be starting with more money, with more property, with more support, or more experience but still draw those lines on the map, even if there's no way you can start by buying a warehouse, you might make that lateral shift onto the path later. Or if there's no way you can start by hiring a TV crew or whatever other suggestions there were, there might be a time to shift later. Now, I don't know if any of you travel much, but I'm a serious planner when I'm leaving my house. I price every airline, I check different times, leave one day before, one day after, right? Um, I pack and I repack everything. I want to make sure I have everything, but I want to have it as small as possible, especially because I prefer to do a carry-on when possible. Um, I always pack an extra pair of underwear because when I was six, my mom would always make me pack a just-in-case pair. So just like booking your travel or packing, we need to be prepared in moving on to a venture of starting our own business as well. There are two different parts of preparing for a trip. There are two different parts, I think, of checking your focus. Gathering information and then considering what I'm going to call today the logical cautions, which are the opposite of the logical positives. So in gathering information, this is an inc incredibly important task before you start anything else. You need to know what you're getting yourself into. This is a crucial component of writing a business proposal. It's a crucial component of writing a grant proposal. Um, you need to do the market research. What are the needs for what you're offering? 
here, regionally, nationally, globally? Ask yourself questions like, how close is the competition? And this can be close like, how similar to you are, is the competition? How similar to your skills, your talent, or your product? This can be, how close are they geographically to you? Um, are you on their turf if you're starting this new business? Will you be fighting, or will you be competing for the same clients or the same students or the same audience? Um, and how close in to you as far as where they are in their career? Are they starting off also? Are they settled and established? Are they retiring? Um, if, a, if somebody is not close to you as far as that goes, if they're about to retire, then this might be a perfect time and a perfect place for you to be starting something like that. You also need to ask questions like, what are you bringing to the table? And these need to be facts. What personal resources are you able to offer? How much of your personal money are you willing to commit? How much of your time? So a lot of you, probably most of, most of you, are still in school. Are you working another job? Is this something that you can start while you're in school? Do you need to wait until you're done with school? Can you work another job and start this next venture? You can also ask yourself what skills and talents you have that are directly related to your focus. And then ask yourself what other skills do you have that might influence achieving the focus in some way. And then, since this is a broad room, what other information do you need? Now, here's the part that a lot of people don't like, checking the logical cautions. Checking the logical cautions is not shooting down your idea. It's making sure that you have everything set so your ship doesn't sink. This might be what keeps that boat from sinking. I highly recommend writing down all of the cautions that you come up with, but move on. Don't dwell on the cautions. Don't think yourselves in circles. Don't dwell on your hesitations, or else your ship might never sail. With that in mind, do <coughs> consider that it might be best for that ship to not sail if you come up with so many logical cautions. So the kind of question that you can ask yourself for writing on your little tablet is, this won't work because, or I need to wait because. So to make it a logical caution, it needs to have an explanation, a logical explanation, the because. If you just say this doesn't work, that is just your emotional co emotion coming to play. And there is a place for emotion, but we tend to dwell on the emotion even more than anything else. We, we, it's easy for us to, to convey our emotion so much more than it is for us to come up with a reason. So lots of questions might come up. Will you have enough time or money to see the venture through? Alternatively, will you be able to handle the demands of success? I once thought that I wanted to have the largest music studio in the Midwest, with the most flute students, with people hired under me. Um, when the thought of having the largest studio actually started happening, I realized how tiring that is. Um, right now, I'm in that place where I'm having trouble scheduling students. Um, I'm having trouble fitting them into the venues where I teach, using with the venue schedules. There's just not enough time, there's not enough space for me to meet the demand. And turning the student away or the client away is not fun. Every student I turn away is one who will be disappointed, and I don't like that, that makes me sad. I also think about the money that I'm not making if I turn a student away. I worry that in the future I'll have a student drop out and I'll have lost a potential client because I turned them away. If I'd just taken one more, then I would <laughs> be fine. Um, I also consider that when sending students to another teacher, they might start taking their friends with them. So success is something that we need to plan for too. In um, the business part of the DeBono, we talk about a candy company that launched a candy product that was so successful. They'd done the market research, they knew what ingredients people would like, they knew what kind of packaging people would like, and they launched the candy, and the candy eventually failed. And the reason it failed wasn't because it wasn't loved or because it wasn't wanted. The reason it failed was because this particular store couldn't keep it on the shelves long enough and get it back on the shelves fast enough to keep the interest. And they tried relaunching the same candy product under a different name, and it just didn't take off as well the second time. People started associating, oh, this tastes like 
that one candy I had before. So success is something you also have to plan for. Can you handle the success? If your business is an industry, can you keep up with the demand long enough and enough to keep the product visible and accessible on the shelves? If you're in the fine arts, can you print enough scores or enough books or print enough photographs to have one in the hands of everyone who wants it before they move on to the next composer or author or photographer? People get distracted, something shiny comes out. Um, in any business, once you start saying no to people, people will stop asking. Once your product or idea loses its edge, you've just created an opening for somebody else to fill that space. Um, there's, uh, have any of you heard of the Pennsylvania Academy of Music? I know there's a faculty member that knew of it. The Pennsylvania Academy of Music, just a short background, was one of the East Coast <coughs> Um, most prominent preparatory <coughs> schools for college students, or for high school students specifically, who are wanting to have careers in music. We actually offered a high school diploma in music. Um, our students went on to places like Curtis, my students went on even to Curtis, Juilliard, Carnegie, NYU, Manhattan School, um, the East Coast <coughs> schools. Um, but sometimes we can get to be, as they did, and other products can as well, we get to be too good. So there's the pros and cons to consider with becoming elitist. I learned an important lesson from, from Pam. After 20 years of their success teaching the most promising students, they built a $40 million performing arts center. And then the economy suffered. But during those first few years of financial suffering, they didn't change their offerings. <coughs> they still wanted to cater only to the best, the best, most talented students. Our enrollment dropped, because parents weren't willing to pay the tuition. And by then, we had lost and alienated ourselves. We lost our roots and alienated ourselves from the community. They closed in bankruptcy within two years of building that, that new performing arts center, the $40 million performing arts center. Elitus is tricky. Um, we all want to work with the best. We all want to be the best. Um, and we want people who want the best. But sometimes you can risk losing community support and involvement. So when you are deciding how successful you want to be, also keep in mind how much are you going to rely on other people, how you're making yourself look to those other people, how involved you're going to ask or allow those other people to be. Um, because in many fields, especially arts-related business fields, we rely on a community. Um, with all that in mind, this step is forming the logical cautions. Um, you also need to ask yourself, will you be able to recover if your idea doesn't work? In doing so, you need to make sure that you don't burn any bridges with your current or future boss, just in case you need to go back to them for a while. Um, try to keep some savings on hand to get yourself through tough times. Um, try to keep savings on hand in case you need to get your business through a slow month or if you need to start anew. Put your whole heart into what you do, but tell your heart it will be okay if you decide to take another path in the future. I cooked that too soon, I'm sorry. <laughs> so what concerns do you have? Um, don't wait till after you launch yourself to consider the what ifs. Write these down and address them logically. Don't think yourselves in circles. If you can live with the consequences or overcome them through alternative options, then confidently move on. So you've made the list. Consider, can you live with those consequences, with those cautions? And if you can live with them, great. If you see cautions, but there are alternatives or there's some way to get around it, then you move on confidently. And that's what the next step is about. Um, so after you've got the information, you've made the cautions, you might have a different perspective of your initial focus. Um, the next step is a challenge. Define, redefine, or refine your focus. The main concept of challenge in any field isn't to say that something is bad or it's a bad idea to start, but maybe there's a better one. Challenge has its place in every field, in every industry, 
every single day, but it's one that we in this culture especially shy away from. And especially in places where there are a lot of people who have enough intelligence to defend their ideas, it's oftentimes hard to bring challenge up. But challenge is something that can save time if you've challenged a process. It's something that can save resources if you've removed something that wasn't needed. It's one that can streamline the process. So there are ways to challenge something non-offensively. Non and the three questions we ask to challenge something non-offensively are, can this or any part of this be cut? And it doesn't have to be your main focus. It could be a part of the focus. It could be one of those logical cautions you came up with. If it cannot be cut, why can it not be cut? What is its function? What is it doing that is making it an important part of your life, making it an important part of the focus, making it an important part of the process? And then ask yourself simply, are there, are there alternatives? When I challenged my idea of opening a music school based on my value system, I quickly determined that yes, the thought of my beautiful real estate being the center of St. Louis arts community can be cut, and I can still do what I love. So I began to consider alternatives. So when in seeking alternatives, be open to try new things. When seeking alternatives, be open, open to breaking tradition. And when you're seeking alternatives, be open to setting a new standard. You don't have to be afraid to be the first person to do something that's awesome and different. In seeking alternatives, I decided to consider totally redefining my focus. And in redefining a focus, there are two questions to ask. Um, the first question is, this is a way of doing what? And the second question is simply, what's stopping you? So for me, after seeing the cost of real estate in the St. Louis area, and I wasn't exactly sure that I was going to settle there, I had just moved. I realized pretty early on that my ideas were more grandiose than my commitment to making the financial risks. So for me, these steps ultimately changed the direction I was thinking. I redefined my focus. I then began thinking to myself, how do I teach music? The options were many. The options were accessible. And for the most part, many of the options were more exciting than they were risky. So you can actually, on your paper, draw exactly a table, a format, write your focus, how to start my performing arts school. Above it, simply write the question, this is a way of doing what? So for me, starting a performing arts school was a way of impacting youth, a way of teaching music, a way of strengthening the arts scene in my region, and a way of being part of a community. What was stopping me from opening or starting the art school was I didn't have buy-in from other teachers in St. Louis simply because I didn't yet know any of them. Um, I had a limited network, not just with other teachers, but in Illinois, I had a limited network of people who might be willing to financially back it, which is different than Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, because I worked in fundraising, I knew all of the people who could financially back something like that and who had interests in supporting arts. Um, I was being stopped because of real estate. It was hard to find something that was affordable, that was convenient to the markets that I was trying to reach on the Illinois side, um, which is kind of spread out like a fan um, that was on the Illinois side, because many Illinois people won't drive into Missouri, and that was safe and convenient for people. But what was probably most uh, stopping me was the financial commitment. I could have used this tool to work around some of my logical cautions. I could have used this tool to say, how do I raise money for a performing arts school and come up with new ideas to do that? Or I could have said, how do I get buy-in from other teachers? But for me, it reminded me of some of the values I set earlier. I decided that I wasn't ready to invest too much money into a market new to me. So I wanted to take a route where I'd begin by teaching lessons out of my home or anywhere else. I focused on alternatives that met the desires of my clients and filled the gaps of current offerings also. By that I mean I attended a parent focus group um, around 
closing music schools. O'Fallon School District also cut all of their music programs from K through eight. Um, and also the Pennsylvania Academy of Music in its closing. And uh, I've attended several parent focus groups. And one time a mom suggested to me that I offer door-to-door -door music lessons. Have any of you music students out there been asked to do drive to a student's house for the half an hour you're there? Um, <coughs> Every parent in the room nodded approvingly, saying, but that's the great way to run your business. But my value of caring about my time was stronger to me than that. I was actually horrified when all of the mothers in the room, or parents in the room, sorry, were suggesting that I drive door to door to each and every one of their houses to offer lessons. Um, but I thought, what is it that they're really asking? And then I saw alternatives to offer the convenience to those parents, which is what they really wanted. I then worked closely with a few band directors, and I eventually worked at a deal where I adopt their school. My new business model included my driving to a different school every day, one trip, one school, um, which only slightly stretched my value of time. Um, most of my students take their lessons during the school day or right after school, and this plan seemingly filled the needs of the students for lessons. It seemingly filled the needs of the parents for convenience. It fulfilled the needs of band directors for additional support in their programs. And it fulfilled my needs for income. And I didn't have to pay a penny out of pocket, which is one of the things that was holding me back, that was stopping me. So it was a new plan that seemed to work really very well for me fit within my values, it met the needs of my customers, and that made a very happy um, middle ground. So since I was re uh, redefining my focus entirely, I went through and reviewed the first three few steps that we talked about. I supported that idea. I looked at information. Um, I brought up what information I need to know, how many miles I'm driving, how much money I need for gas, those kind of things. I made a list of my logical cautions for my new focus. Um, I wanted to make sure that the path that I was choosing was one where I could find reward and success. So with my focus in sight and my values in mind and a new path chosen, I was ready to prepare for this new journey. Another thing I learned from the Pennsylvania Academy of Music, its restructuring and its closing is that behind every good business is a good business plan. So in the step before where you gathered information, you've already done the market research, you've already allotted your research resources. So write it down and show it to everyone. <coughs> Other benefits of a good business plan are that there might be people who want to see that plan succeed. They might buy in as partners, they might offer loans, they might offer a gift toward it, especially if you're moving in the direction of a nonprofit, which are tax deductible donations then. Um, they might be family members who are trying to help you out, whatever it might be. Um, they might see enough potential that they'll actually offer you their advice, or they might see enough potential that they'll give you something that might be even more valuable, which is critique. So show it to everybody and Take from it what you can, be it thoughts or um, income or <laughs> a nest of some kind. So. so there are three important words in business, especially in starting a new business. And those words are network, network, and network. You need to network and befriend your competition. And if you can't befriend your competition, at least be careful not to burn those bridges. Be careful not to step on their toes. Be care careful not to otherwise piss them off. It will and can come back at you. I know positively that I've gotten a lot of work from colleagues. And I know I've given my fair share of work to others. When I left Pennsylvania, I had enough students to absolutely pay every one of my bills, my new car, my house, everything. I left Pennsylvania to move to Illinois, and I gave all of those students to other teachers that I liked. <laughs> the teachers that I did not like, I did not suggest any students go study with them. It's also useful, if you can, in networking, collaborate with colleagues, um, either in a related field 
or a completely different industry? Can you partner with somebody who does exactly the same thing? It's going to strengthen your product. It's going to strengthen your reach outward if you can. Can you partner with somebody who has extra space for you to use? Maybe you don't need to buy a building yet, but you can just rent a room. Can you um, partner with somebody who, has, who targets the same audience, but for a different reason? For example, if you want to make a living playing weddings, you might partner up with a photographer, or jeweler, or florist, or dressmaker, or a wedding planner, or a whatever else has to do with weddings. You can link them on your website. They can link you on their website. You can refer, they can refer, and it really strengthens the reach that you have in getting your product out there. Product for many of us musicians would be ourselves and our talent. You also need to learn the desires of your clients. There's certainly a difference between selling out and playing smart. Playing smart evolves your ideas, but stay within your value system. I mentioned this before, but provide a service that is meaningful to your clients, but rewarding to you. So I changed what I was doing. I changed the way that I taught. I changed everything about my music studio being the center of, of the uh, flute community to my going out. But it didn't change any of my values. So I, I didn't feel like I was selling out. I just was evolving the way that I was offering my services. Uh, then begin to pr uh, produce your product, brand your product, and market your product. If you're an, unsure of what those things mean, then you should sign up and become a minor in the entrepreneur department. Um, because this highly varies depending on what your focus is. Know that you might have to give a little to get a lot, be prepared for some out-of-pocket expense. Be prepared to devote a lot of time and a lot of your energy. So when I first began pounding the pavement in St. Louis, I offered free clinics to every high school within a 30-minute drive. I met with directors and asked them what they needed and how I could help them reach their goals. My efforts paid off within one week. From a business standpoint, take an accounting class or hire an accountant. Taxes are complicated. Self-employment taxes are scary. And things are very different than they used to be. Probably the number one most stressful thing in my <coughs> professional life are self-employment taxes. <laughs> things are different. When Auntie Ruth taught piano lessons in her basement, she probably didn't report her income and no one was any wiser. But now your bank accounts are online. Every check deposited is scanned. Um, your income is much more visible. People can see the quality of life that you're living just by Googling your name. <laughs> um, there are even, in the music world, there are several forums that are speculating that the IRS is targeting musicians and artists because we make easy targets. Um, we can't hire lawyers or whatever it might be, but Regardless, I say, play it safe, get an accountant, pay your taxes, do it the right way. Um, along with Auntie Ruth's um, basement piano stuff, when I was teaching in Pennsylvania after the school closed, I was teaching out of my house, and I had to take out an entirely new insurance rider on my house in case a student came into my house and tripped and fell on the stairs. These aren't things that my teacher ever considered. And these are things that we now need to pay attention to if you are starting a business in your own property. And it's also an additional expense. Um, with all of these expenses, with all these thoughts, keep immaculate records. Keep a record of every dollar you spend toward your focus. Keep a record of every mile you drive that's going toward your focus, of every minute you spend going toward your focus. Keep immaculate records. Write everything down, play it safe. So hopefully that's not scary because actually it's really rewarding having your own job. <laughs> so the next step is just to dive in. You've got your values in check. You've done the 
fo you've decided your focus, you've done all of the things, dive in and have fun. So in summary, the six main parts of determining, I suppose, if you're ready to evolve as a creative type business owner are determining your values, set your focus and support it with logical positives, check your focus with information, check your focus with logical cautions, challenge your focus, redefine, refine your focus until it fits. Prepare the business, <coughs> dive in and have fun. I have just a couple of nuggets that I wanted to put in, but I didn't know where to, they fit. So I have a little extra slide here. Behind every good, good business is a good business plan, as mentioned before. You have to give a little, get a little. Don't be afraid to try new things, to break tradition, to set new standards. Be prepared for success. Set a focus and seek as many unique and viable paths to get there. Tire yourself on that path toward success, but enjoy life and what you do. And if it's within your values, you probably will. Um, be open to critique because it's one of the best tools we have to learn. It, open to critique is one of the best ways that we know if and when an evolution of our business plan is necessary. And constantly redefine and refine your focus. This isn't a one-time thing when you're first writing your business plan. Redefining and refining your focus is something that you can do every day, every week, every time there's a lull in the business, every time there's a growth in your business, every time you think that the economy is changing, every time you see your next door neighbor move in or move out. Refine, redefine, and you can never know what you're going to learn from doing such things. Um, our world is constantly changing. I like to think of it as, because I'm an optimist, as being for the better. But we as people who are going to be our own boss or have our own business have to constantly change, have to constantly evolve along with it.